everyone to this special uh, gathering and discussion for the Science Circle this November 9th. I'm Stephen Gazier slash Zootfly in Second Life. We decided to have a kind of open discussion uh, on a topic about thinking about the future, that uh, visions of the future from science fiction. We wanted to have a couple panel discussions again, a couple are our distinguished board members of the Science Circle, but then also make it an open conversation and discussion for everyone in the audience. And that's because in my uh, history of reading scientific literature, but also science fiction, watching movies, all of those things, that science fiction plays a very special role in the narratives that we create uh, ourselves. And that's because being able to expand beyond the realm of the mundane gives storytellers certain uh, liberty to explore ideas and concepts that otherwise are difficult to portray. And so with that in mind, we think that science fiction, to go along with speculative science or, uh, again, the actual trends of where science has taken us, this becomes a really good conversation. I think it ends up being very timely right now. So our panelists today will be Mike Shaw, Natalie Foster, and Karthik, who will all um, talk a little bit about some of their favorite science fiction and really how the narratives of that science fiction connects to uh, our world today. Uh, although I will start with my personal favorite, although I will be very brief about it and go from there. But again, if any of you do want to share something, probably at about the half hour mark, and you have a slide that you want me to present, just send it to me and I am. I'll put it onto the board that I have here, and that way, and then you can share in voice or in text. So uh, with that, oh, I'm sorry. So in terms of the order where we're going to go, since Karthik sent me uh, some slides, I'm going to have him go first, and then Natalie, you'll go. Again, Natalie is uh, sumo in world, and then uh, Mike, I think, will we'll play the cleanup batter position. All right. So for me, I grew up... Oop. That, that, of course, went the wrong way. All right. So I decided to pick... Well, what happened to my slide? Oh, shoot. Hold on. Let me take a look at something here. For some reason, my top slide is not showing up. Although it's right there. Let me try this again. Here we go. All right. Battlestar Galactica. Again, the original Battlestar Galactica was a TV movie, or sorry, was a theater movie, and then kind of spliced up and turned into a serial uh, TV show, I think on NBC. It was a production of Glenn Larson. So in many ways, uh, it was being developed concurrently with Star Wars. Uh, great show. It got a reboot. And, uh, and the reboot uh, really put in a lot more story arc, uh, allusions to politics, and a little bit more of a tied-up storyline. I think in many ways, the first Battlestar Galactica from the 1970s, it had about... I mean, the the story writing serialization complexity of Scooby-Doo in many ways. But it was action. It was great. It told a great story. It had a, the evil guys and the good guys and had a nice, nice story. Uh, yeah. So the reboot, I think, also a very interesting story that what I'm really going to focus a little bit more on in terms of how I describe, I think, this vision of the future, although oddly enough, also a vision of the past. Yeah, Mike was saying he loved the first series. I was about 10 years old, and that's how old I was, too. And, uh, and Scissor G, again, follows up with what I was saying. It had, a, it had a certain 70s camp feel to it, and if you look back on it, you'll see that. But, uh, you know, I think the actors just did such a good job of making it a fun show to watch and without being too serious about itself. All right, so the plot synopsis is you had this world of humans. They make robots as servants. And then the robots become advanced and aware. And they're known as Cylons. Again, 
this advancement to an almost human looking version uh, to a human looking version that was not in the original series that was something unique to the reboot of course the robots with the self-awareness rebelled and mostly kicked the humans butts but there were a small subset that went on the run to find a mythical lost colony of humans that they thought could help them in their fight against the Cylons, that they were in advance. And this was all like, and this is one of these first parts where there's both a prophecy and a history that has a certain religious supernatural belief element to it that is one of the driving motivating forces of the show. Uh, now, this conflict on the run, this is how you have, you know, five seasons, well, four and a half seasons worth of TV shows. But during all that time, it turns out that some of the humans were actually Cylon sleeper agents that even themselves did not know they were Cylons. And crazy enough, one of them fell in love with a human and they had a basically hybrid baby. They eventually get to a final conflict. There's a big fight and they, uh, they do land on, I'm, I'm just gonna call it New Earth. And they introduce agriculture and then it turns out, at least the way they end it, they allude to the baby being mitochondrial Eve. In other words, the refugees from this fight end up becoming the new batch of humans on the new planet. And what I have in the picture at the top right, were within the storyline, there were two characters who, would, who basically saw... A they were the only ones who could see a supernatural being that they interacted with. And at the end of the, the very last show, the very ending clip of the show, actually, these two, and I'm going to just say in quotes, angels, they were kind of thought of as angels, basically were talking about how they're hoping this batch of humans, uh, that they don't come into the same heartbreak and problems and everything that just happened, and that they allude to the fact that this has happened multiple times. So they, again, allude to, there are, and this was true in the original show as well, that there were, there were supernatural agents and powers that are at play within the universe. And so, again, what I really liked about it is that, one, of course, it is a uh, fear of technology run amok, of getting it too advanced, where then it has dire consequences. And so, yeah, I mean... If we start developing AI and they start branding it as HAL or Cylon, you know, we, let's not do that, right? Or, uh, you know, T-1000 Skynet. Uh, but I think the other thing, too, was that there was always this sense of hope in the show. And that in the end, it was promoting this idea of at least be able to start over. That there's always this hope at, with a fresh start that you can do something better and do it better the next time. So... That's my quick synopsis, one of my favorite uh, science fiction shows. Anybody want to just, any other quick comments? I saw some stuff in the local chat. I don't know that the story is never trust a human, because you, <laughs> but, but humans, of course, are the ones who cause some problems. Uh, anyway, well, again, one thing to keep in mind is that it's not just the AI. It was also advanced robotics and other stuff. Yeah, I think it's a really, really good show, and the actors they got were top notch. Uh, you just—it's hard to, hard to deny just how well produced and how well made this particular show was. Yes. Well, well, there's also—I well, I won't go into the the freedom of the Cylons in the end too. That's a little too much rabbit holey for this one, but it was—it was actually a very interesting end. The, the, the Cylons were not necessarily thought of as a completely evil enemy. They had—they had their reasons. All right. So Karthik, who's next to me, he is the uh, Wally little icon. If if you don't recognize, I'm K9 from the uh, fourth incarnation of the Doctor Who series. My favorite characters. I'm gonna hopefully get the right slide here. So Karthik, why don't you take it away, and then we'll get the slide out of the way and let Natalie go. Can you guys hear me? I hear you. Okay. Um. So the other guys were going to talk about, um, you know, uh, stuff that you see on TV. I thought I'd spend a bit of time talking about video games. <laughs> um, but but I do think um, there's uh, 
Um, there's quite a lot that we can learn and ask ourselves by following the plots in a number of video games that were released quite um, recently. Um, ASX is actually a, a very nice example of that. Um, I haven't played any of the earlier you know, games in the series, but I think Human Revolution and Mankind Divided, um, I, I really liked the plot in both these games because they highlight the social divisions that can occur in society when people start using their autonomy to do things to their own bodies. Um, so what happens in Deus Ex is, um, you know, human augmentation has become a thing. Uh, it starts to provide people with enhanced abilities, um, but that also leads to certain inequalities, right? Um, only the wealthy or people who are sponsored by corporations are able to afford these advancements. So there's a there's a disparity in class between people who are capable of affording these things and people that can, you know, um, and people who are not. Um, so it and in that sense, it also represents a society that is heavily, you know, controlled by corporations. Um, and in, in this X human revolution, we're introduced to the society in which augmentation has, um, you know, it has become something that's adopted. And then there are protests against it. You know, the, the, the human body is sacred. It shouldn't be altered. Um, and even through these augmentations, people suffer from certain like fallbacks um, in their biological systems that require them to afford drugs, you know, things like neuropathine and stuff to prevent, um, you know, bio-rejection to their implants and stuff like that. Um, and in that sense, they are also at the mercy of these corporations that, that provide the augmentations and the drugs, so on and so forth. Um, but it raises the question of what happens to our humanity when our bodies become modified in such a, um, you know, in, in that way, when um, when we give up what's human physically, you know, to to augment ourselves, so it's a, it's it's a very interesting thing. And then mankind divided addresses, um, you know, it, what what happens in human revolution by the end is um, a lot of people with these augmentations they suffer from neurodegeneration. I think. Um, and and they start going about, they start rioting, and they do all sorts of things, and and that creates a situation um, um, in which they become vastly highly discriminated by society and mankind divided. In mankind divided, you know, they're really struggling, and it becomes a situation in which you know now we have these uh, the Black Lives Matter, you know, all those movements. It becomes a situation in which they need support from the rest of society to even link live amongst us um so that's a yeah that's a very dystopian sort of reality um but i found it quite uh interesting uh, the next slide so in that same sense um a more release more recent game was like i think cyberpunk 2077 um and in Cyberpunk, you know, 2077, you have this augmentation, you have all of that. Um, you can play with the character and customize it and all sorts. So, um, so augmentation is, of course, a, a, a big part of things. But I think what's more important or what's a more interesting topic in Cyberpunk 2077 is the digitization of the human consciousness. Um, and I think um, this, this notion of like immortality and stuff comes up. You know where we are trying to preserve our personalities and our consciousness and the digital format seems to be um, an interesting way um, to do that when but when you do upload your human consciousness um, what then happens to your identity um, does you know is is a digital version of someone really them or is it just a sort of fascist smile um, so when characters seek to preserve their consciousness and in, you know, even achieve immortality by transferring their minds into new bodies or into virtual spaces. It changes, you know, it sort of challenges traditional concepts of life, the, you know, death and the soul. Um, and and so so the, those questions are sort of raised in Cyberpunk, and then you see this very erratic character, uh, Johnny Silverhand, that's played by Keanu Reeves. He comes up and he. It turns out that he's a, he, you know, he he's a sort of digitized 
consciousness. But because of his personality, maybe it seems as though the soul hasn't actually left, in spite of the fact that his body is now a digitized um, sort of entity. Um, but then it also raises questions about what sort of rights these entities um, you know, uh, deserve, right? Um, what sort of rights are they un entitled to, rather? Um, and as we talk about that, we should also sort of think about um, artificial intelligence, right? Because as we start developing these algorithms and these algorithms get uh, more and more complex, can they then start developing a consciousness? And so that sort of leads us into Halo. Um, in Halo, we are introduced uh, to a human, an augmented human soldier called the Master Chief. Um, and and he's given an ancillary, which is Cortana, that's an AI um, sort of avatar. But um, Cortana sort of start, you know, she starts going um, rampant, they call it. She starts developing a consciousness. She starts to feel things. And if, in spite of her own intelligence, you know, she because of, of, of this development of her consciousness, her, her algorithms start going rampant. And then it becomes almost impossible to preserve her. Then it becomes a question of whether or not, um, you know, the, the, that space variation that, that the Master Chief belongs to, whether or not they should delete her, get rid of her. Um, but it also starts exploring the concept of humanity because Cortana, in a sense, Ma you know, Master Chief's a sort of robot in his own right. right? Um, he doesn't really understand feelings. He, he's been trained as a soldier since he was a kid. He's been augmented. All these things have happened to him, but he's slowly starting to learn humanity through by means of an AI that's developing her own consciousness. Um, and in Halo 4, I thought that was really beautifully portrayed, you know, up till the end. Um, and I do think that, you know, if you guys are interested in it, you don't really have to play the games. I don't, sometimes. You can just watch the cutscenes. Um, and some of them are really, they raise some interesting, like, uh, questions and concepts. Uh, yeah, so, so those are my examples. Well, that's a really good one, Karthik. I, you know, I'm going to ask you to put in a little further commentary that what do you think about the drive for people to, in a sense, enable their own longevity or even immortality in the real world today. I do hear a little bit about people trying to do that. Um, yeah, I think it's quite interesting. Um, the question of whether or not you're going to be able to perceive the, you know, um, that that consciousness that's uploaded on, on the digital realm is. Um, is is a very good question. Um, so so that's also like that also raise raises questions about you know the fears about like where do we go after we die and stuff. Do we what do we perceive? What do we see and and things like that. Um, I I think that might be maybe one of the the limiting factors for us to sort of pursue that sort of technology. But imagine like being able to talk to someone that has recently passed away, passed away. You know someone that you miss. Maybe somebody that you that you need like advice from somebody that you wish was still like you know in leadership in your organization in the world or something like that something somebody that you can learn from you know that's a um that I think there are probably uh, motivations that are probably in content at the moment for this for pursuing this some of which are ethical and stuff so yeah I would definitely say that. It's a, it's a bit controversial in the present age, but maybe one day it will be possible. <laughs> yeah, Sizuji mentions the series Altered Carbon, and I just got through the first season of that one. And again, that one's getting very dystopic, <laughs> but uh, it is about being able to maintain your consciousness in a chip, and I think that that is a really interesting one. Um yeah, and I think the other thing, I put a question in the audience, but I do want to move on to Natalie, is that, um, you know, there are these AI girlfriends. I'm getting ads on my Facebook feed all the time if I want an AI girlfriend. And so, you know, part of what Karthik was mentioning here, that's, you know, we're starting to see some of this reality and some of this replacement of human interactions with a very human-like interaction. All right, uh, let's, give her, let's give Karthik a quick round of applause. 
and we'll let Natalie. Thanks for sharing. No game. I think oh, so. Maybe also just to point out that you know the amount of money put into game development, not just the uh, technology, but the serials, you know, the storylines, the character acting, the emotions, uh, the emotiveness of the characters. That's something. That's a lot of money. There's more money put into that and received than in movies. So it's a great place to talk about these types of things. Thank you, Karthik. All right, Natalie, you ready? Ready to go. Uh, thank you all. Um, space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. Uh, I think probably many of you know those words. Uh, as far as my cable channel is concerned, the sun never sets on a telecast of something from the Star Trek universe. Um, I'm going to concentrate exclusively today on the original series, which went from 1996 to 1969, and the next generation, which went from 1987 to 1994. Notice they're 25 years apart in this universe. The original series was 300 years into the future in the 23rd century. The next generation was 80 years beyond that in the Star Trek universe. Um, the key thing that I've enjoyed so much about Star Trek is its essential optimism. Uh, fundamentally, we've, we're still here. We've survived the existential crises that we all recognize today. We find a way to care for each other and to lead ethical lives. And that to me is in large part what many of these Star Trek episodes are about. And I'm also intrigued by the fact that I'm going to bring up some of the same points that both Stephen and, and Karthik have hit on in the way here. First thing I want to ask you to do, though, is take a look at the two crews. The photograph on the left is uh, the, the crew from the original series. And what I want to point out to you is the gentleman on the far left in the front row is Russian. The gentleman on the far left in the back row is Southeast Asian. And the woman next to him is, is both black and a woman. Uh, let me remind you a little bit about what was going on in the United States in the 60s. Uh, we were in a hot war with Vietnam in Southeast Asia. We were in a long-standing Cold War with Russia. Social ferment was huge in terms of the women's movement, but also especially the, the movement for black civil rights. Um, if you take a look at the two gentlemen I mentioned, those people are the, were the face of the enemy in that era. Someone from Southeast Asia, someone from Russia, and yet there they are on the bridge of the enterprise. Michelle Nichols embodied two of the huge political movements going on in the populace of the United States during that period, the women's movement and especially the black civil rights movement. I've heard Michelle Nichols in conversation, and I know several of you have too because we've mentioned this before. She originally wanted to, to quit the show because she didn't have much of a role and she felt she was really sort of a glorified telephone operator. But Jean Rod uh, but uh, Martin Luther King came to see her and said, Michelle, you cannot quit this show. You are such a powerful face for our movement on TV. And of course, that was Dr. Martin Luther King. She had to stay on the show. And to get her there to begin with, she told an interesting story about Roddenberry getting the sh idea for the show through Desi Lou. And he originally didn't have Michelle Nichols there. And then he went in one day and said to the upper management, uh, you know, I want to put a little color on the bridge. And they all said, oh, fine, because they thought they meant he meant, oh, colorful uniforms or, or brightly colored chairs. He meant Michelle Nichols. Roddenberry was incredible. And that's one of the things I think about in terms of Star Trek, just regarding the bridge crew, what an incredible sociological statement that was to have those people there. Now, when you take a look at the next generation, again, 20 years into the future, um, or 25 years into the future in the US, there are also some interesting people in the bridge crew. We have back row, far right, Mr. Worf. Mr. Worf is a Klingon. The Klingons were our enemy in the original series. They are now our allies. And Worf has, is now the chief security officer on the Enterprise. Not bad for 25 years, going from enemy to ally to being chief security officer. Jordi LaForge, top row left. Um, 
Henry the Forge is blind. He's not only a black man, he's blind. And yet he's the navigator, the chief navigator on the starship. They got a blind guy as a navigator. Incredible. In between those two is something that both, someone that both uh, Karthik and, and Stephen alluded to. That's data. Data is an android. Um, data is a very highly developed, very skillful android. And he's a very valued member of the crew. And there was an episode that aired in uh, 1991 called The Measure of a Man, where someone comes in from Starfleet, which is the uh, uh, major organizing body of, of all of these episodes. And uh, the guy wants to take Data back to the lab and disassemble him to see if he can be recreated. And it ends up in a, in a uh, actual trial where Picard de defends and defines Data's humanity, even though he is an android. So it's a, it's a fascinating series in that regard. Now, the other thing I want to mention about this series is something a little, uh, uh, a little uh, geeky, perhaps. Uh, yes, because Riker had to take the opposition, and it was, it was a marvelous, marvelous discussion of what constitutes humanity. I, I agree. It was, it was brilliant. Um, there's another piece about Star Trek that I want to mention in terms of science fiction literature. But as I said, it's a little more a uh, bit of geeky techno babble. But uh, uh, all I want to say is that both the original series and the Next Generation had certain common plot lines that popped up. One of them being um, the transfer of information by spies, espionage. Um, I will admit, in the Next Generation, they talk more and fight less. But there's still there's still conflicts going on. So there's still espionage happening. In Journey to Babel by DC Fontana, um, 1967, star date 3842.3, for those of you who are graduates of Starfleet Elite Academy. Uh, in Journey to Babel, the, the Enterprise is transporting a bunch of delegates to a meeting for all of the uh, civilizations that are part of the Federation. And um, they find they're being tracked by a uh, ship that nobody can identify. They don't really know what's going on. A couple strange things happen. And they find there's a spy on board. The spy's name is Telev. He's a surgically altered Andorian. Um, if you remember the Andorians, they're, they're kind of they're like pale blue, you know, and they have these antenna. And um, they found that Telev has a radio transmitter in one of his antenna. And he is transmitting information to uh, his colleagues in this ship that's trailing the Enterprise and causing these problems that, that I mentioned that I won't go into. Now, in, this was interesting to me because in 1960s, James Bond notwithstanding, um, a radio was probably the best technology available to transmit coded information. As a matter of fact, this show aired in 67. In 1966, the American Cryptogram Association published an article in which they said, and I will quote this, today, so much secret information is contained in coded radio messages that crypt, an crypt analysts can intercept more intelligence than secret agents can steal. But it was all just done by radio. And admittedly, in Star Trek 23rd century, this is just a radio. It's a really powerful one. It can send encoded in information, but it's still just a radio. Let's go up 25 years to The Next Generation, a show called The Drumhead, written by Jerry Taylor, aired in 1991. Starfleet grads can see the star date number. Um, there is a Klingon exobiologist on board in an exchange mission, and he's been on there quite a while. Um, some strange things start happening is the best way I can describe it. Um, the the all warp drives becomes disabled, and all of a sudden they find out through Starfleet that plans for a new dilithium chamber that were secret in the Federation have shown up in Romulan hands. Well, one thing leads to another, and Worf finds out that uh, Jadan is a spy. And Jadan, as I said, is a Klingon, and he has a, a hypo syringe that he brought on board because he uses it to inject uh, a, a treatment or something, some syndrome he has, some some uh, medical syndrome. But Worf finds out that this syringe that Judan has is really very special. It's fitted with, and pardon the techno babble, but this is what they said, 
an optical device that can read data from Starfleet isolinear chips. Well, what that means is the dam has this hypo syringe that is fitted with a reader that can take information out of the Star Trek computer. Um, it can then code that information in the form of a protein that's resistant to enzymatic degradation. Uh, this whole idea of coding something in a protein is something that Francis Crick, who was one of the people who got a Nobel Prize for working on DNA structure, um, presaged way back in the 60s. Crick is famous for saying that a protein was like a long sentence written in a language that has 20 letters. Um, well, Jadan could code informa digital information from a computer into a protein. He could then inject that protein into someone else. Their body became a carrier of these top secret files. That file could, that protein could then be fished out, decoded, and the information um, made available to whoever had the code. That is a hot piece of espionage. Well, scientifically, how did that work out? One thing that happened in the intervening 20 years on Earth is that um, making proteins that could withstand enzymatic degradation, that didn't trigger the immune system, that could be identified and fished out of a lot of other proteins was a major thrust in drug design efforts during that period. So Star Trek was really right up to date in terms of what was being done with proteins and they just, ex that's exactly my point tag. Uh, but that was being worked on and in that era and and uh, we have to allow that maybe in 300 years they could figure out how to do that but my point is again that in those 25 earth years separating those two episodes the two versions of star trek reflect what's going on scientifically um, in the world in terms of scientific interest and then extending a bit you know it's a it's a um it's an interesting illustration of learning about scientific history on Earth by looking at these two shows. But I still will go back now to where I started about the essential optimism of Star Trek. You know, if you know the series, San Francisco still exists. It's a home of Starfleet. It hasn't fallen into the sea. It hasn't been covered because of global of ocean encroaching because of global warming. Um, all sorts of other things still exist that we value, including the things I started out with mentioning, the fact that, that we're human beings, we've extended ourselves into using um, um, sentient robots, uh, we've uh, done all sorts of other things, but we still care for each other, we still value each other, and uh, that makes me very optimistic about uh, the future, <laughs> and that's, uh, that's my take on Star Trek. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you, Natalie. I think Star Trek, you know, of all the science fiction, uh, maybe along with Star Wars, is the one that has been most uh, pervasive and recognized within us. And it's such a such a nice thing that it did, does have a positive view of the future. Although, again, as people who, who may not be familiar, the show, the movie First Contact, then also, of course, uh, Khan, though there were some... Uh, heavily stressful conflict times in in our near future history but the show does keep coming back to different species working together and i think you know the klingons and uh the federation becoming allies i think that's a great example anybody yeah. want to comment on star trek anybody who uh, has dressed up or has really any sort of other angle on what they think about star trek in modern modern day yeah, if I can use voice here, uh, I assume we can all use voice for this discussion. Sure, go ahead. Discussion. Yeah, um, yeah. I just wanted to say that uh, I agree with pretty much everything that um, Sumo said there. Um, but uh, as I put in the, in the comments, uh, it, it's somewhat ironic that uh, in these science fiction shows, especially involving space travel, they don't seem to understand how spaceships move in space. They don't move like airplanes. And it would be nice if they had, you know, better science consultants or at least listen to their science consultants. Oh yes, Sis. I'll, let me add to that. You're absolutely right. They do have. They did have a science consultant. 
they didn't always listen to him because what was, you know, Star Trek is essentially about entertainment. And there's a lot of, you know, quite frankly, ridiculous stuff that they do scientifically as well. But there's also some really good stuff. And um, um, I just choose to concentrate on those things that are good. And I, I, you know, I think we can all find a lot of things that are awkward in the series. But uh, I, I agree with you absolutely. That's, uh, that's very true. Well, the problem I have with artistic licenses, is called, is um, that um, it, it doesn't really make the show better if you don't have spaceships not moving like spaceships. Um, yeah, I mean, you can do it like in, in um, if you want to see something that's more realistic about how spaceships move, watch um, watch The Expanse. Um, that, that was a rather impressive series. It was based on a series of books that were very well written. The physics is very realistic, at least as far as human technology was concerned. Oh, I agree too. The Expanse was superb. Yeah, the Expanse was super great. And I think, you know, in that case, they didn't propose, at least that we had, faster than light travel, but they did something in the end along the lines of Stargate, where a super advanced civilization was probably taking advantage of some sort of wormhole space time to make stargate type things where you could travel long distance. so i got it. good stuff but yeah the storytelling in that one was just really really good all right i think let's give everyone a round of applause to natalie i really I'm so glad that we have star trek represented and let's take it away mike Okay, just getting all the things I need to click on, click on. There we go. So, um, I, I didn't prepare nearly as much as um, uh, Natalie and uh, Karthik did. I just wanted to talk about a couple of authors. Um, and, um, you know, basically we're on the gamut of some, some early uh, sorts of uh, science fiction, the later sorts of science fiction. This, this crowd seems to be uh, into the space opera. And, and, and I love the space operas. But I'm going to talk about two authors, um, one from like the 40s and 50s, uh, E.E. Doc Smith, um, very early space opera stuff, and then Alistair Reynolds, uh, who's uh, active today. So um, I've um, famously stolen art from uh, Deviant Art. Uh, this first slide here is actually showing the planet Yellowstone uh, with, um, with uh, the remains of uh, the Gorilla Band, which I'll explain um, a little bit later, um, and uh, is featured from uh, Alistair Reynolds' uh, work. So yeah, there's my title slides, my, my picks. Um, and yeah, so um, again, shamelessly, uh, let me put my laser on. Backslash one, laser on. Yeah, and again, my laser pointer is always sideways. Not sure why, but it is. Um, and again, I have shamelessly um, stolen uh, art from um, uh, Deviant Art in this uh, case. The ship is the Dauntless, uh, and it's. Uh, Described as a super dreadnought, uh, it's uh, described as being tear shaped. Um, Smith and his spaceships was always worried about uh, friction. His faster than light travel was based on something that he called the inertialess drive, which neutralized the inertia of matter and basically made um, anything within the field into a tachyon. It could go as uh, fast as it needed to without limit, um, and the only thing that would limit its speed would be the friction with the interstellar medium. So things tended to be smooth, like teardrops or spheres, or um, in in this case, something something that looks like a um, cylinder. So um, you know, this is like grand cosmic space opera stuff. There are um, both uh, good guys and bad guys. Uh, if you're 10 years old, this is the sort of thing you want to read. There's very clear-cut lines of like how one behaves and how one doesn't behave. 
and uh, you know there is no moral middle ground. Um, and uh, that's problematic because as an adult, I kind of see how um, the um, good guys uh, would basically see me as uh, like uh, one of the bad guys for like uh, you know popping, you know being um, for individual rights and law and order and um, you know things like uh, um, uh, being against unreasonable search and seizure and things like that. So yeah, um, when one is young, one uh, enjoys things a little bit more. Um, so yeah, um, this uh, real, real basic stuff. So it's a great read. I have a lot of links in my presentation, and to give you a link to a PDF of my presentation, there it is. I just loaded it up onto my uh, website, and then um, if anyone wants to like download the artwork for themselves, um, these these are free downloads from DeviantArt, um, and then the Wikipedia things on uh, E. Smith. Um, interesting how some of these things how like this series was built up. Um, these dates, these things came from the wiki side. These were the dates in the publications of the books. But um, Galactic Patrol itself, the third one in this series, uh, was serialized in the pulp magazines um, in, uh, earlier. Um, and it was the first one. And, uh, you know, there were sequels and sequels, and then there were prequels, and then, uh, you know, today one has a recommended um, order. Um, that one has, one has a uh, recommended order. Uh, so, um, let's see. Um, and in each book, there ended up being a grander uh, villain, right? So in Galactic Patrol, uh, it ended up being very much like a Star Trek sort of villain. There was like a pirate base somewhere, and the guy in charge of the pirate base would be, um, uh, you know, would be the villain. And Gray, um, Gray Landsman, that kind of uh, was a, um, you know, there was a race of people who were mentally more advanced, Second stage Lensman, there was an even another race of people, even more advanced, and there was a renegade who was running all the bad guys from behind um, the, the scenes. Um, and in uh, the last one, it ended up uh, like being a whole other race of people who were running bad things behind the scenes. And Ian e. Smith went back and edited all of the uh, books. Uh, so that they could be published, so that they would have a unified sort of thing. So you kind of miss um, that development. But um, yeah, so uh, no art. Uh, you know, when you're reading these, you have pictures in your head. This particular one has uh, Dauntless uh, moving away from a planet named Jarnavon. It was where some of the um, bad guys were living. Uh, and the good guys um, were able to uh, weaponize planets, and they smushed the uh, planet of the bad guys in, in between two faster-than-light moving um, planetoids. Uh, yeah, that's one way of dealing with uh, things. Uh, the other way of dealing with things is to talk things out with your feelings. So. Uh, basically, uh, basically, um, um, Edie Smith was um, um, inspiration, I think, for a lot of the space opera. His descriptions of how shields work, I recognize that in uh, Star Trek, the visual effects, and you know, basically how the um, you know the um, um, energy is uh, distributed around ships and the like. Um, Alistair Reynolds is a modern writer. Um, he's a um, astrophysicist turned writer, uh, so he knows how relativity works. Um, he has had a great number of books uh, published at this point. Um, the series I'd like to talk about um, 
today is basically like uh, his revelation space universe. And there's a book, there, there's a whole bunch of books, kind of, you know, a whole, whole bunch of books, uh, like several series with it, set within this universe. Um, one thing I like is uh, his descriptions of um, ships. Uh, what I've got here is um, uh, art by Steve Burke, again, stolen from Devia, DeviantArt.com. Uh, the ship's name is Nostalgia for Infinity, and it's cone-shaped. It has a huge, basically, iceberg inside of it as reaction mass. Uh, that mass gets pumped out the back because um, Newton's laws say that you have to have um, action and reaction. And uh, the shape of this uh, is basically to reduce friction so that uh, when you're traveling near the speed of light, you're um, you know, not wasting your reaction mass. This is called a light hugger ship. Um, in the Revelation Space Universe, faster than light travel uh, is possible, but it's so dangerous that uh, no one, no race, uh, really ever uses it because uh, it's a good way of just turning yourself into, like, scrambled matter. Um, it's not just about uh, technology, it's about the people, uh, so the different groups of people. Uh, the, the, the stories are set in kind of um, in the next thousand years or so, in the next thousand years or so, and uh, in that time we start to see how uh, people, um, groups of people, basically diverge from like the basic uh, human sort of blueprint. Um, and so one group of people are ultras. They tend to be the folks who. Um, uh, have the best uh, spaceships, these light hugger ships, and um, they uh, do a lot of uh, physical and mental enhancements. Uh, they use technology to enhance themselves, uh, and their their enhancements are highly individualistic. It's basically uh, like almost like body art what they do, um, but they are extremely individualistic. Uh, so you know, it's it it's. A situation where they um, are, um, you know, basically, um, you know, basically act as individuals, uh, even though they may have some mental enhancements with um, technology, uh, they're not really messing with like uh, like who they are, right? Um, that would um, I'm going to skip ahead to the conjoiners here. That that actually contrasts with the conjoiners. They are, also have physical and mental abilities that are uh, enhanced. Uh, nowhere near like the radical enhancements that uh, the ultras would do. But um, they um, use technology to basically link together and uh, have almost a hive mind. They're still individuals. This is not like the Borg, but uh, they also... Um, participate in a uh, hive mind uh, and you know, eventually eventually uh, they kind of move their consciousness into the, the hive. I mean there may be like a shriveled brain in a jar somewhere that has the last bit of an elderly conjoiner somewhere and then that may die and then the conjoiner is um, supported entirely by technology. And in between uh, DeMarcus these are um, these are uh, folks um, who believes so strongly in democracy that every aspect of society gets voted on. They have chips in their heads and they vote several times a day on um, things that happen. Their government is basically all about um, the entire populace uh, voting. Um, in the plan on the planet Yellowstone, uh, in orbit around that planet, there are habitats. There are thousands of habitats, each of which could be like just a couple of people or thousands of people. Each habitat is its own little society. Uh, they're all part of a greater society of DeMarcus who get to vote, but each little society gets to run however it wants. Um, that's a lovely thing, lovely thing. Let me, uh, let me go on to my next slide here. I realize we're uh, running running out of time. Uh, so here's just the, the, the series Revelation Space Redemption Arc Absolution Gap Inhibitor Phase. 
Um, the inhibitor sequence is basically um, about when people start uh, doing their space travels, they find, uh, oh, look, there's uh, older civilizations out here. Why can't we see any trace of any of them? And then eventually they find out why. A uh, bit of a spoiler, um, there's um, tech that hunts down uh, civilizations and makes sure that they don't leave their own solar system. Um, the prefect, um, the second series, is basically like, like murder mysteries almost in a science fiction setting. It's, it's quite, quite wonderful. Um, and um, they basically take place in uh, the glitter band, um, and it's the policing system of the glitter band at work. Um, and again, they, there is a um, there is a uh, enemy. It happens to be a true AI, uh, which leads to the downfall of the glitter band. Which um, a couple of hundred years later, we uh, see um, described in Kazan City, which is a city on Yellowstone, where um, since the glitter band has been um, utterly destroyed by this AI, the um, the uh, uh, refugees have to take um, uh, refuge on, on the actual planet and, and, and live there. So, let's see, I think I just got one couple more slides here. Um, here's another uh, nice little picture for those of you who like size comparisons of the um, ships from a different series. There's a whole bunch here. Here's a base ship from uh, Cylon. Here's the Rendezvous with Rama ship. Uh, I think up here is the Star Wars corner. Um, there's some Star Trek things over here um, in, what, in my little uh, square. That's a detail. It's lovely there. Um, and the uh, link, of course, um, you can access that in the PDF that I've um, uh, posted. So let's go back. Um, yeah, so that's the same. That's the same thing. That's this one in. And I'm not going to talk about Stephen Baxter today. This is a teaser. Um, but uh, if we do this again, Stephen Baxter's work is something that we'll talk about. So with that, I'll uh, draw it to a, a close today and uh, basically thank everyone for coming and uh, thank everyone for their uh, all of their attention. Let's give Mike a round of applause. <clears throat> yeah, I really find some of these things about the enhancements to humans and how that would work. That's potentially near future. Uh, so I think it's nice if we can have a bigger discussion about the ethics of a lot of that. Anything that you would say along those lines, Mike, before we, um, I, I'll open up the floor after I give Mike a chance to respond. Okay. So, um, we already have cyborgs. My mom's a cyborg. She's got an artificial knee, right? I mean, and I have a colleague with a, with, with a titanium hip, right? So we already have cyborgs. Um, now, um, I think that um, I think that one wonderful thing about um, uh, this sort of technology is that as we get older, um, maybe some body parts that are problematic can actually get replaced and uh, have allow us to have better and better quality of life. Um, you know, I think I think that um, I, I, I think that um, we. It, it, best to experience being like human first, right? We're not like Borg babies where, um, you know, things get start getting replaced really, really young. I think, uh, you know, if we're going to be enhanced, it's nice to know like what uh, the basic functions, basic systems are. Um, for medical stuff, I'm, I'm all for, um, you know, and enhancements and stuff. I, I worry about like uh, just cosmetic. I, cosmetic is not quite the word I want to use here, but I worry about uh, like 
you know, if I only let's get um, a brain chip um, installed so that I can access the neural internet. Um, and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. I would worry about that because, to, well, to be facetious, it's like, how do I turn off the um, um, advertising, right? I mean, I'm having a dream, and then, um, you know, some brand of toothpaste is uh, telling me that I need to buy my toothpaste or something like that. Yeah, um, so uh, I... There may be things that people need to do um, to enhance themselves in order to be able to work in space, like um, what the ultras do on the light huggers, uh, you know, but I would kind of like to see what the limits of what people can do um, without enhancing software. Thank you, Mike. And Siz, uh, I'll give you first um, first call on some comments that you wanted to make. Yeah, uh, thanks, Stephen. Uh, I just wanted to say um, that uh, what I find most interesting about science fiction is that a lot of past science fiction has come true. Not all of it, but it has come true. Um, like uh, video phones, well, you know, cell phones can be used as video phones, even if they're not always used that way. Uh, there's this, the internet, the, the World Wide Web, uh, it's like it's becoming a world-sized brain uh, where we all, we're all connected to it. Um, but there's this sort of fuzzy boundary between science reality and science fiction, and that boundary is slowly shifting. And I point um, to my uh, to the uh, a, a small city in uh, eastern Canada in Nova Scotia called uh, Canso, Nova Scotia, uh, Canada, one of Canada's uh, uh, Atlantic provinces. Nova Scotia has a town called Canso, um, and that, that that is planned to become um, a spaceport. Um, I don't know if that will actually happen, but that's the plan for now. So, I mean, Canada will be part of a spacefaring, uh, will become a space, really spacefaring nation instead of relying on the U.S. all the time. But we'll have, we'll have our own spaceport, supposedly. So, I mean, and this is going to happen probably in a number of places around the world. So, it's like uh, what science fiction is becoming reality, and I find that particularly exciting. So, I just wanted to mention that as well as, you know, things that have already become reality yeah agreed i think it's progress is always interesting if not always uh the most democratized or always helpful but yeah no i think um visions do come true in this case oh yeah gus makes the comment which i'll just reiterate are our, our, our brain chips gonna have to have pop-up blockers <laughs> yeah, that's Anyone else? Anyone else have any sort of open comments? And then I think we'll definitely be done by 11.05, just to respect the, t the time and the clock. A tagline describes a future viewpoint on death becoming that humans over human histories have seen themselves as growing ill or injured and dying so that death came from those situations. Um, those very situations might be seen as similar to animals being killed on the roadways by high-speed vehicles because they do not understand the situation. In other words, imagine if all death as we have known it is similar to roadkill because humans were not as smart as they think they are. Yes, there can be some pretty dire, unforeseen consequences of um, not being aware of what we do, which I think, again, is why we want to have these conversations of not just what's the fancy new gizmo, uh, once it's been released, but as people develop their ideas and their prototypes and they start to think about marketing them, what's what's the best way to think about the most good for each one? Yeah, no, I think the question of what happens to our normal biological pathway that's driven by evolution uh, could be a very different is, is, will be subverted by what we do with technology. Uh, this is worries about being subverted like the Borg. I think, again, as long as we're rationally figuring out how we're using technology and who's in control of it, that will be good. But Astro makes the point that 
is it can be similar to the old British lords, the uh, peasants, and that relationship. No, I think we need to collectively think about this very, very deeply when we think about new technology. And I think I will actually say one of the nice things about the AI conversation that we've had is that I don't think the technology is so advanced it can do much, but it actually has engendered a much more widespread conversation among people about the dangers of it in addition to the benefits. Well, one thing I can point out is you already have people that have um, uh, animated prosthetics. They can have artificial hands that actually work as hands. And now they not only transmit, uh, they connect them to motor nerves, but also sensory nerves. So they can have a sense of touch with these artificial hands. So we can actually uh, become like cyborgs. It's, it's already starting. Um, interfaces with brains, they already have interfaces with brains that allow you to see, um, not see in great detail, but uh, th there, are, um, there are interfaces with the brain that exist now. But I think that's a good point. A lot of certain technologies are definitely driven by a strong medical need. You know, there are also brain implants that help regulate electricity pathways in the brain to deal with, say, say schizophrenia uh, or depression. And so a lot of these things are really important as beneficial devices or, or tools. So we'll see. We'll see how it all plays out. I think let's give all of everyone, let's give ourselves a collective round of applause for having a great conversation. Again, uh, thanking the panelists again for preparing ahead of time. And there's some wonderful costumes out there as well. So uh, everyone have a wonderful rest of your weekend and uh, always check the Science Circle events calendar on the web for upcoming events. Have a great one. Live long and prosper, I might even say. <laughs>